How long this planet has been enslaved, the psyops that are going on, the propaganda the government's feeding us, the deception that's going on on Earth, and so much more. And even Dan's going to give us some of the timelines. Um, I guess might as well, Dan, you, unless you want to start with something different, I was going to say we might as well go back to the beginning when we were enslaved 450,000 years ago. What do you think about that? <clears throat> well, um, I guess Stitchin has more of the handle on that one uh, than I do. But uh, you know, uh, in the you know, it's interesting that a Hollywood company in uh, this year uh, asked me to write an article on media control, you know, regarding the UFO issue, and I that link to the website, uh, the webmatrix.net. Um, I started to try to put together a. Uh, chronological sequence to try to understand it myself to wrap my head around it because uh, of my own personal experiences you know being an ex-ABC newsman and actually experiencing firsthand numerous times exactly how the psychological operations are interacting with uh, the disclosure of this information and sanitizing it to the public of the world and, and implications of what this, what this information would mean to every single living person on this planet. So, you know, there, there's a deception being perpetrated to the people of the world, you know, which is uh, due to this indoctrination through the control of all the information that we're born into. And, you know, it may be difficult for some to wrap their minds around this reality. I know I did. I mean, even though I had a first-hand military experience, um, you know, back in 1969 when I was uh, when the Navy, I, I, you know, still I, I was looking in the newspapers trying to find something about a, uh, a reddish-orange glowing elliptical object coming off of off Port Bell from a ship, you know, from a secret message that was uh, going to the Chief of Naval Operations. I couldn't find anything, and, you know, I just kept an interest for many years. And then, uh, Well, hold then on. I, if you don't mind me interrupting, yeah. can you actually talk sure. about that? that 69 event a little more in detail because that that you just enthralled me right there when you're talking about you know an orange elliptical object uh, going up and then we'll of course we'll pick up from there i just want to get that uh, more in detail if you don't mind sure yeah i um uh, i had a high level top secret clip to level 14 with extra sensitive material handling security clearance worked at the uh Naval Communication Station in San Francisco, which was the busiest military communication hub on the entire planet at the time. So we had all these messages, you know, secret, top secret, and everything being processed through there. It was very highly compartmented. I had to wear special colored badges, which would let you into different compartments. I was a um, certified high-speed code operator, so I was in charge of the code room which was a little room that uh, had about nine uh, circuits. I had to listen to, you know, Morse code, you know, simultaneously listen to the, the ship sending in messages. And I, you know, jump on that channel and I take the message. And you have to have, if it's classified, you have to go through authentication. Anyway, I took thousands of messages. And one just, you know, burned an image in the back of my head. As I was typing it out, I couldn't believe what I was typing. Um, it seemed that there was a U.S. and a ship that was off the coast of Alaska, and the, the sailors on board, they uh, witnessed visually off Port Bow coming out of the ocean uh, about 70 feet in diameter. It was a, uh, basically a saucer, an elliptical object is what they described in the report. It was about 70 feet in diameter, glowing reddish-orange. It merged out of the ocean, immediately shot straight up into space, and was going, according to the radar operator that was tracking the blips on it, going over 7,000 miles per hour. It was classified as secret. It was a priority message. Um, it was going to the chief of naval operations in Washington, D.C. I had enough information on it that I wanted to, when I went to Washington in 2001 to testify, I wanted, like the other witnesses who brought along supporting official documentation supporting their witness testimony, I contacted Office of Naval Intelligence, 
but uh, they, I gave them enough information, but they said it's been uh, destroyed, the information. So unlike the other witnesses, uh, basically I just had my word on that. And then, uh, and then years later, I worked for about 13 years in the Naval Electronic Engineering Center on uh, satellite communications for the military. My coworker, who worked at the uh, NORAD facility, when he first started working on there, the screens that track everything out in space and in the air, you could see the UFOs would come in going thousands of miles per hour, making right angle turns. He inquired, his over, older supervisor told him, oh, it's just a visit from one of our little friends, like, you know, no big deal. So, um, you yeah, know, this stuff has been going on for some time. I looked in the San Francisco Chronicle, tried to find something. I mean, like, what is this thing? You know, it's like, I used to love the science fiction movies in the 50s, you know, and, but, you know, for many years, I, uh, I you know, I developed an interest because I knew there was something going on, and until I... Uh, I heard that uh, Dr. Greer had assembled hundreds of witnesses and 21 were willing to, uh, I mean, high-level witnesses that were willing to go to Washington. Uh, what happened was one of the witnesses chickened out and there was an opening and I said, well, it's appropriate. I'd be willing to go there and support. So, you know, I, I paid on my own ticket. I never got any compensation uh, for that, but uh, went there and um, testified. That's how that came about. <laughs> yeah, well, we're glad you testified because obviously we needed whistleblowers such as yourself who have such a clearance who were able to see such things. Now, again, it, what uh, you love the science fiction in the movies. One thing that I always hate is how the debunkers say, well, we created the gray aliens because of the science fiction movies from the 50s. Well, what about the damn uh, – from a hundred or thousands of years ago, the American Indians, that, that famous painting of, of all these gray aliens faces and, and all these other references. But point being, uh, like you said, you saw something coming out of the water. And I wanted to get to a, something, a major question that I heard from Timothy Good that there and, – and obviously recently, as you know, on being on the West Coast, there is something found in Malibu, which could be – some people say is an ET base. Timothy Good has been talking about underwater ET bases for the longest time, and Preston Dennett is an expert on – USOs, underwater, you know, un unidentified submerg submergible objects, which are the same as UFOs. Do you think it was leaving an ET base or maybe exploration? Or I mean, it's just a speculation, of course, but what do you think it was doing? And why do you think the military covered it up? Well, it, uh, that's an interesting question. I've been trying to do some research. I, there's a book called Invisible Residence by Ivan Samerson, who was a Navy man that went all through the Naval Intelligence reports, and he had to run across mine. And what he discovered, I was uh, kind of surprised, is that more than 50% of the sightings are, are coming, UFOs coming, or they'd be USOs when they're under the water, turning into UFOs as they come out of the ocean 50 percent of them are coming in and out and a lot of them are coming out of antarctica and uh and what's interesting i was looking at this russian documentary that uh was talking about uh, it was a skip thorn he was an astrophysicist that determined that there is uh wormholes above the earth one above uh alaska <laughs> coincidentally yes. and the other one's above uh antarctica and what they do is they use these as uh, portals to, uh, to jump, basically, from one location to the other. They can go in and out, in one and out the other and out the other and in the other, you know. So they, they use both of these for uh, – and it's interesting that uh, – Dan, it's John in London. You know, when you talk about these portals, I, I know I've heard of a place called New Schwabenland in Antarctica – and so when you look at Google, they sort of show you strips, but when it gets to the sensitive areas, you get a really fuzzy bit. Are we talking about this region of of Antarctica? Oh, yeah, you know, the New Schwabenland, that's totally fascinating, you know, when you think about it, because the Nazis started back in 1938, you know, expeditions out there, and according to the um, Grand Admiral of the Nazi U-boats, um, oh, what was his name? Anyway, he said that... Uh, Bird, right? Animal and bird? No, 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 no. Um, uh, uh, anyway, he he was the he was the head of the Nazi U-boats. You know. Oh. He was oh, his oh. grand admiral. Anyway, he said uh, we've made an impenetrable citadel for our Fuhrer at the other end of the world. He made the statement in 1943, 
And we know that uh, not all the scientists, not all the top scientists came over in Project Paperclip. And over 250,000 Germans after the war, you know, accounting for casualties and everything else, were totally unaccounted for, along with some of the top Nazi uh, brass. And over 100 of the uh, Nazi U-boats, including the ones with the most advanced technologies, I mean, you know, and then Admiral Byrd, you know, which was a 33rd degree mason that was sent down to Antarctica in 1940, uh, 19, 1946 uh, with a whole military armada in order to destroy the Nazi base. Um, by the way, he was a 33rd degree mason that was sent by uh, James Forrestal under the Truman administration. And according to, I think, a Peruvian paper or some. South American paper down there that leaked part of the story, you know, that the flying discs were coming out of the ocean and attacking and that half of the yeah. fleet or something like that was destroyed. So uh, as far as we Mr. know, that, uh, and that not so in, in his in his uh, in his memoirs, didn't he, that, that there were, you know, discs coming out of the ocean, uh, you know, in the memoirs of Christopher Columbus. Yes, yes, that too. Yeah, it, it's been throughout, you know, it's like a. It's a phenomenon that's been happening for, uh, you know, the beginning of human race. Uh, we actually already have a caller, uh, area code 519. Welcome to the show. Do you have a question for Dan? Um, no, actually, I'm just going to sit here and listen for a little bit because oh. I've been listening on the radio for a bit. And uh, um, maybe I have a question. Yes, I do. Um, I would like to know. I'm, I'm calling from the side of the United States of America. Tell us your name, too, by the way, or a name. So Frank. My name is Frank, okay? okay? And I'm falling from Canada. Okay, excellent. And I know our Canadian politics, and I know what the, the whole thing about Canada is and its politics and whatnot. Do the American people real um, know the difference between the United States and the United States of America? That is my question. I've, you know, I've listened so long for so many years, yet um, I see your president when he's in Washington say United States, but even outside of Washington, it's always United States of America. What is, what is, what's that all about? Okay, it's because... Corporate business. business. It's a business, that's right. But do most Mer Americans even realize that? Dan, what do you think? That's my question. Uh, I, no, I've read different things where, depending on how you spell it, you know, if you spell it with lowercase or if you spell it with uppercase... Uh, you know, whether or not the flag has a gold fringe around it, whether it's maritime law or whatnot. There's a whole lot. Yeah, it, it's amazing, you know, how the attorneys and how things have been manipulated through time so that there's these little, for the people who are in the know, to know what terminology to use and under what jurisdiction you'd be under. So I'm no expert on that by any means. I, I, I guess my, my uh, I guess, and I, and I grasp where you're coming from. I, I realize, you know, that all that, all that esoteric uh, realization of that, I guess. But do most Americans get it? And that's where the problem lies. And the, the other thing is, too, I'm just going to put it out there, okay? America is not the world. There's the rest of us, too, Okay. Just keep that in mind, <laughs> okay? Um, when, when, when you're speaking, there, okay, America is not the only place in the world. There's the rest of us as well. And does America even know where it's at? Uh, well, okay, yeah, I'm in London, America. and, uh, you know, I think they're yeah. well in tune with what's going on. I, I yeah, uh, personally, myself, I, I'm just across the border, and I have to uh, disagree with you there. Most most of those themselves that call themselves Americans don't know what's going on with their own government. They I would have know. to agree there. We, I didn't know very much until I was educated. Dan, you became a whistleblower because of what you learned, right? Uh, well, I became a whistleblower exactly. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to agree with our caller that you know, we're, we're talking planetary here, but the main controlling elements are with the United States. Uh, I think everybody can agree on that one. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I, once I became aware of the hundreds of witness testimonies that 
and how it came about, uh, yeah, I realized that something needed to be said, you know, and, and support this effort in every any way. You know, I'm just I'm only one of over 500 and some witnesses. I'm and my testimony is like a a small insignificant fragment of the whole picture. There is much greater, more profound, uh, explosive testimonies of some of the other witnesses with collaborating uh, documentation, but. You know, I, I see what's going on with the, uh, the psychological operations in the media, and I just feel like I need to speak out. Do, do you think that, like, 9-11 happening pretty straight after your uh, 2001, you know, disclosure project, do you think that that was a big sort of, like, uh, event to just, you know, to, to put the, the information away from, from UFOs at that point? Do you think that had something to do with it? Well, it was building up momentum. Um, you know, I toured across the country with Dr. Greer after the Bush administration denied a congressional hearing. What a surprise, right? Um, so we went, uh, and since the mainstream media was, you know, sanitizing all the information out, so we decided to go to every who, single who major allows city. Sanitization? You know, you work for ABC. Who do you see it being like the contributors? Is it your Ted Turner's, you know, or is it lower down or... You know, is there an unseen, unheard of echelon like Council on Foreign Relations, these type of things? Oh, well, um, <clears throat> what, what it is, yeah, I wanted to go into that. But what I was just, just going to complete the thought is that I went to, on the west coast of the United States, I went to the major cities. And every major city, when the local ABC, NBC, CBS, you know, the local networks would come in, without exception, they would put in the giggle factor with the whole thing. But how, how this is controlled, the, the newspaper reporters that you see on your television screen, they're perfectly innocent. All they're doing is reading the script. I, I saw this one little funny Oops, on Russia yeah. Today that, uh, you know, it, it had something where it had recorded the TV announcers across the country on different networks. And what it was saying was, uh, the Easter Bunny this year has lost some spring of its step due to the economic sanctions. I mean, that's a pretty unusual statement, right? But you hear every single one of the uh, newscasters on the, the various networks across the country. Somebody took the time and recorded all of them. I don't know how they did it, but everybody's saying, you know, the Easter Bunny this year, blah, blah, blah. blah. So it shows that what it is is the CIA controls all the distribution of information. That is the key. And the CIA is tied into you know, the Tavistock Institute, which uh, basically has you know, billions of dollars in the think tanks that psychologically uh, prepare the information in such a way as to engineer, engineer the consent of the public. And you know, it would be curious to find out what percentage, as the caller brought in, what percentage of the populace is really aware, which I think only the NSA, with their massive uh, artificial intelligence quantum computers, really knows the answer to that one. Dan, um, uh, you know, when you had 9-11, we had a, a couple of years later the, the same playoff, and it was called 7-7. And, you know, that happened outside the Tavistock Institution, and there was a red blood up on the roses. Did, you know, did that mean anything to you? Did you think there was some sort of psychological sort of information within that or do you think it was just sort of you know accidental oh uh, in in what exactly okay in london we had a bomb go off called the 7-7 attack in london oh oh right 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 I, i'm with you now and okay yeah famous picture shows you know a little white star van parked in the road next to the bus with no no roof that's been blown off white star by the way was the subsidiary of Controlled Demolition Inc. The British subsidiary is called White Star, and they drive around these little vans. And the van was, you know, fifty meters, a hundred meters away. Again, it could have been a coincidence, but you know, a lot of people talk about controlled demolition with nine eleven and the company, you know, Demolition Inc. I just thought it was canny that in all the photographs you see of this this bus with no lid, there's that van sitting there with controlled demolition. But it doesn't say that. It says White Star. But the building that the bus blew up at. Is outside this Tavistock institution. My understanding is is MK Ultra, which is Manchurian Candidate Mind Programming, mm. is also headed created by that. Alan Dulles. Yes. Can I, yeah. Can uh, you know the uh, I, you know like in the movie The Matrix, you know there's uh, 
glitches that happen every so often. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, and during 9-11, there was a exercise being done that was exactly what was happening at 9-11. So it's totally confusing. I know that the 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 London bombing had exactly the same situation where an exercise was going on for the exact situation that was happening in reality you know which is which would add to confusion for people is this real yeah. or is this a exercise yeah that's right it's all it's all mind control programming and uh, on a mass scale so for instance that morning i remember clearly coming home on the tube and uh, every every tube station had police at about seven o'clock in the morning. And when I, when I eventually got to my own station, I said, "Why is there so many police here? You know, why is there police on every station?" And they said, "Oh, there's been a, a power outage on the subway." That was their story. By the time I got in at eight o'clock and then put the news on, and it was about nine o'clock in the morning, then everything went to mayhem. And then, as you say, it goes from you know this exercise into a real event. And and Peter Powers from from Cobra, which is our security firm that deals with emergency management powers. He said, um, yeah, it was, it was my job. I was up till 2 o'clock in the morning. As you know, we've got a lot of banks in London, and we have a lot of Israeli banks and Israeli interests. And so it was my job to uh, make sure we get quick time doing and quick time thinking. And so, um, you know, and the guy who's reporting to him says, what, so what a coincidence that this morning you were doing an exercise of exactly the same thing on the same stations and he said, "Yes, it's it's a uh, it's it's a." Uh, he couldn't really answer, you know, but it just shows you that, you know, and 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 then you've got all the FEMA people at nine eleven sitting there, at, you know, the day before, running an exercise. It's 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 just played out that way, so that if it goes wrong, they can say no, it's only an exercise. But when it plays out in the big picture, you know, job done. Well, my mother always used to say there was an old Argentine saying that the devil always forgets to put the lid back on the cookie jar, and. Um, you know, there's a lot of cookie jar lids out yeah. there. And Hitler said, the bigger the lie, the more the people will believe it. Well, that's exactly what Adolf Hitler said. He said that, you in know, a, in a, oh, looks like we're going into the break. Yeah, everybody hang tight. Rome Radio will be right back in just a few short minutes. As we said earlier, we have an incredible show. We've been speaking with Dan Willis, who has been a military witness at the citizen hearing or this uh, the disclosure project put on by Dr. Greer in 2001 among uh, several witnesses who spoke at the actual event in D.C. among about 500 witnesses that he was able to videotape in total that talked about their their parts uh, throughout what happened in the, their military careers where the government was hiding stuff. And right before we went to break, we were talking about so much stuff, but Dan, being in the Navy, you had a Crypto 4 clearance, you witnessed an incredible event in 1969, and then you obviously started to speak about it in 2001. You dropped off the grid for a while. We're glad you're back to tell us your story and to tell us your website, which we might as well plug in now, the webmatrix.net. But let's go back, Dan, to what we were saying uh, before break, uh, before we got uh, sidetracked. In 1969, you saw that object coming out of the ocean, right? Uh, and then you explained in detail what it was, and we speculated what it came from. Tell us, what do you think, uh, or let's, let's proceed with your story from there. What led you to become a whistleblower? You know, just a clarification, I received a message from the ship. The crew on the ship visually witnessed it, as well as the radar operator you know, tracking it. Um, what led me to be a whistleblower is, oh, let's say, I... Uh, I <laughs> I kind of crashed a cocktail party, you know, for uh, Laughlin, Nevada. A friend wanted to go, uh, she wanted to go to this UFO conference, and I really wasn't interested, you know, because it's just the same old thing. It was like, it's like an alien zoo, you know, with all the, all the crazy stuff. And, uh, and then I heard about Dr. Greer was going to go to, you know, how to head up FAA, you know, captain, nuclear launch officers. People saw alien bases on the other side of the moon. Everybody willing to go there and testify under oath. Um, and what happened was I got involved. Uh, I just happened to know the president of Lockheed International. And, uh, and so what we were doing was putting together a four-hour executive briefing video for the members of Congress and the president and everybody, as well as a 500-page briefing document. And I became intimately aware of all these witness testimonies. And, you know, and this, was in, this was the year 2000. And so, 
it took me, I still was having a hard time, even though I had my military experience, and even in 1984, uh, after I quit my job at the uh, Naval Electronic Engineering Center, I was going up in the mountains to uh, the Hopi Reservation with my brother, and I was pulled off the side of the road to rest, and he yanked me out of the truck and just, look, 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 look. And it was at night, and a, and a flying disc flew about 100 feet above our head uh, that was uh, glowing white with a greenish hue to it and did a sharp right-angle turn. So, you know, it just kind of like resubstantiated the reality of this thing, you know, beside everything else. Um, and so what really did it was I kind of knew that, yeah, UFOs are here, not surprising, or, you know, probably half of them are secret military projects, you know. Um, but after hearing all the witness testimonies and putting the pieces together, I realized, uh, my God, you know, they've suppressed this technology that, uh, and, and the reason I'm doing this now is that, you know, you look at the Gulf oil spill, you look at Fukushima, um, you know, I have a pretty good technical background, so after the press conference um, and after the congressional hearing was denied, uh, you know, I volunteered as one of six technical advisors. Uh, everybody had a PhD to go around the, the planet and meeting with these different scientists and inventors that had over unity energy devices. And, uh, you know, the horror stories I've heard in the National Security Act, there's like over 5,000 patents have been suppressed from the people of the world for energy solutions by the CIA with National Security Acts. I've met with scientists that uh, had had their laboratory cleaned out. Uh, this one physicist I know, he had a, a crystal that was oscillating and was doing a tremendous amount of energy, and the whole thing was, was disassembled, and he had a National Security Act slapped on him. And this has happened time and again. You know, so that's why I'm doing these shows, because the human race has been kept purposely retarded while in these black projects, advanced technology. I mean, we've had uh, faster than light craft back in the fifties. Uh, we haven't needed, uh, we haven't needed nuclear. We haven't needed oil. We haven't needed coal for at least 60 years now. Um, you know, so to answer your question, but back when we left off last time, we were talking about false flag events, and I just wanted to mention that uh, um, Adolf Hitler, you know, in his uh, approach on PSYOPs, you know, said that a big lie, you have to tell a really, really big lie in order to get the people to believe it because people couldn't imagine such a a infamous lie could be told, and because it's such a big lie, it has a certain degree of credibility in it. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the Ragstack building that he did, he blamed it on the communists. You look at, uh, you know, Building 7 and the missile hole in the Pentagon, you look at the big, huge uh, uh, memorial with museum with pictures of the of the terrorists that, that took over our multi-billion dollar defense system with uh, box cutters from a guy inside of a cave. I mean, you look at, uh, <laughs> you know, you look at these different events that, uh, that happen. And, you know, one of our witnesses in, uh, that testified, that joined me at the uh, uh, 2001 uh, disclosure event was the spokesperson for Werner von Braun, who was, if anybody brought into the inside plans of what the future plans would be, he would have. And on his deathbed, he said that first they planned to do the Soviets would be a false flag event in order, in order to uh, move their agenda forward. And then they talked about rogue nations. Then they talked about terrorists. We're going to have to have a war on terror type of situation, which we know four months after you know, the uh, disclosure event you know, 9-11 happened. And then they talked about asteroids. And the final card, uh, as he said, would be an extraterrestrial threat that we would have to, the militaries of the world would have to unite. We'd have to drop our differences and unite in a one world to fight this evil alien foe. But we already know that they have the advanced anti-gravity craft that they've been hiding all these years, that while we have props of... Uh, 
needing rockets to go in to fuel, you know, to fuel rockets to go into space and that we need uh, dangerous leaking nuclear power plants to give us electricity and gasoline for our cars. Well, they have a whole other technology that's been hidden in this breakaway civilization they've been creating since, uh, you know, way back when. Um, you know, what the, the, the direction the whole Earth is going is, is why I'm, I'm wanting to kind of lend my voice into uh, showing what, what psychological operations are going on in order to uh, keep the people unaware of this whole other reality that's going on because of how they do it. It's all about being born into the indoctrination and in controlling the education, the mainstream media, and, uh, and, and people's perception. You know, I have a ton of questions for you, but Laura has been waiting to ask some of these, so I'm going to get Laura to ask. Go ahead, Laura. Okay. Um, my, my question primarily revolves around uh, an idea I, I picked up from a researcher who writes for Veterans Today. His name's Dr. Preston James, and he speaks in terms of multiple alien races and alliances uh, who have, who essentially are at war. And in, and in that conflict, uh, we've got We've got the folks who are basically in control here, who who have us, who pretty much have us down on the farm, and and their adversaries. Um, what's your view on on this kind of idea of a, a conflict, uh, and a war in heaven, let's say? Hmm. Thanks, Laura. I you know I I don't I don't talk about anything I don't have direct firsthand knowledge of or have an experience of or is based upon witness testimonies that uh, a lot of them have you know, information. I'm familiar with uh, some of Preston uh, James's articles talking about the uh, draconian reptilians versus the, uh, the tall whites, the Nordics. Uh, and, you know, they're, he, you know, very well could be, you know, they're very well could be. I, I don't know. I don't have firsthand knowledge of that. But I do know that uh, one of the witnesses that was at the disclosure, one of the 21 witnesses, uh, knew that by 1989, uh, our government had categorized over 57 different species of extraterrestrials that Earth has been interacting with. Clifford Stone. That's right. Clifford Stone. I remember that when he said that. And as a matter of fact, if I'm not mistaken, uh, since 1989, they've come up on so many more. Now, I'm going to go back to a few things, comment on what you said. First of all, you are, you've hit every nail on the head. Uh, you've obviously been around, and I, that's why I love having you as a guest on the show. Uh, Werner Von Braun, you're absolutely right with that. Dr. Greer said that. Carol Rosen, uh, when she was on, was talking about that that they're going to play that final card of that ET threat. But yet we've always had the technology and the suppression of patents. This You are so right about that, and that's one thing that worries me. And then some people go even further. They, and they don't even file a patent. They'll just make, create the item. Two cases that I know of in particular were these gentlemen who created water cars, one in Japan. I remember the video was out. I even have it from a, uh, on DVD before it was deleted from YouTube. And anyway, he was showing it to the local media. He was driving around, and then he opened up the hood and showed how it worked. And a week later, the guy's gone. The car's gone. I mean, nowhere to be found, nowhere to be heard from. And then I heard well, there was... Like Joan Rivers, you know, she's dead. She, she made a statement a couple of weeks back, and a week later, she's brown. But nonetheless, Dan, you hit, you hit it on the head that they're suppressing these pads. Why do they want to keep us in check? You're right. We, they, they want to keep us retarded. Why... Why do you think they're doing that? I know that's a speculation question, and then we'll go back into what else they've been doing with PSYOPs, but why do you think they've been... Why do they want to keep us in check? So they can be millionaire playboys using this technology, so they can continue running us to the ground, or is it uh, to kill us off? What do you think it's for? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll be clear what things are that are my, my opinion, speculation, and things I, I, I know for, for real. Um, and my opinion on that is that this group, uh, which apparently, you know, you, you see the same names coming up, you know, Rothschild, Rockefeller, Bilderbergs, you know, the 
And the Nazis are basically just a, a faction within that group, you know. Um, you've got Phoenix and you've got, like, you know, the think tanks. You've got to put these names up as well, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's all tied together. I guess we just call them the cabal or the group, you know. Anyway, this, this group uh, apparently views the entire human race as just a, uh, a resource uh, to use for labor and, and creating income. I mean, they, uh, they work on, on retarding us, you know, poisoning us uh, with fluoride in the water, GMOs in the food, chemtrails, you know, inoculate us with, uh, with mercury and all these different things that they do to uh, retard us. They, they give us complete false information. They, they hide the, the true archaeological in, uh, information that shows, you know, what the origins of the humankind are. Uh, religion seems to be, play a part in all this whole thing. All the while they do this, they view themselves as, this is my opinion anyway, uh, that uh, they, are the, they are the intellectual elite. They are the ruling class and uh, that they uh, have this breakaway civilization that, which you can imagine since the 50s, uh, you know, like Ben Rich said in 1993 at the UCLA conference, uh, you know, anything you can imagine, we've already done these black projects, but it would take an act of God in order to get them out to release to humanity. So these highly compartmented black projects that, are taking in trillions and trillions of dollars. You can imagine across the board in every area of science, you know, genetics, uh, space flight, you know, with their secret uh, space program that they have going on. Uh, you know, one of the witnesses that, uh, uh, you know, Carl Wolf of the Air Force, in, uh, before they went to the moon and the Lunar Orbiter Project, he was brought in. And he visually witnessed very clearly the alien base where it had, uh, or it could be Nazi or it could be U.S., you know, but he said it was an alien base on the other side of the moon with domes and towers and everything. And he said, oh, and here it is 30 years later, and I hope to see it on the evening news. And now it is like 47 years later, and it still hasn't got on the evening news. And, you know, if you'd like, I have a... Uh, I've condensed an hour and a half of the press conference for all those who haven't heard it and just took the most, some of the best uh, testimonies and reduced it down. It's kind of long. It's six minutes long, but it'll give all the listeners uh, a feel for what was being disclosed back in 2001. Let's do it. Okay, here we go. Mm -hmm. The only thing, Dan, I hope it doesn't take yes, us to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, I hope it doesn't take us to break in about five minutes, but go for it. Let's play it. Oh, okay. Um, if it we'll, does, we'll, 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 I'll pause it, and yes. we'll pick it up after the break. Okay, exactly. here we go. Oh, I just want to say, the first one is John Callahan, head of FAA division. Um, he uh, was sworn to secrecy by the CIA, but they, they didn't take all the information. He had backups, and he brought all the, all the information, a huge amount of information. Uh, we have Donna Hare airbrushing the UFOs out, Clifford Stone, 80, 57 different species, Carl Wolf, alien base on the other side of the moon, um, uh, and Robert Salas, which a lot of people know is you know, on the nuclear launch officer and them shutting down with the red glowing UFO. And here we go. Yeah, the CIA here, one of the CIA men told the people they were now sworn to secrecy that this meeting never happened and this event never happened. So when I asked them why, uh, uh, you know, I thought it was probably just a stealth bomber at the time, he said, well, this is the first time that we have uh, recorded radar data on a UFO, and these guys are going to get all excited uh, drooling over all this data. I said, well, are you going to tell the public about it? And he says, no, we don't tell the public about this. It would uh, panic the public. I was stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Montana, as a missile launch officer. I got a call from my security guard, primary security guard upstairs. I was downstairs 60 feet underground in a capsule uh, monitoring and uh, controlling 10 uh, nuclear-tipped Minuteman missiles. I got a call that morning that they were seeing strange lights flying in the sky. I got another call, and this time it was a more uh, intense tone in the, in the guard's uh, voice. It was very, clearly very frightened. He said there was a 
bright, glowing red object hovering outside the front gate. It was oval-shaped. Um, he had all the other guards out there with the weapons drawn. My weapons started going down one after the other. They went into a no-go condition, what we call no-go condition. They were unlaunchable. Within minutes of having received that second phone call of a UFO hovering outside the front gate, we were informed that a similar similar incident happened at Echo Flight. They lost all 10 of their weapons where UFOs were sighted over the launch facilities. So we were taking pictures all the time for verification of nuclear disarmament. And there were some objects in those pictures that didn't belong there. The second throng, prong to this whole thing is that a lot of people talk about conspiracies over shadow government. I'm willing to testify before Congress that these black operations do exist. I was stationed at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. In 1965, I was loaned to the Lunar Orbiter Project at NASA on Langley Field. I went to the facility, and when I walked into the facility, there were scientists from all over the world. A uh, airman second class was in the dark room at that time. About 30 minutes into the process, he said to me, um, in a very distressed way, um, by the way, we've discovered a base on the backside of the moon. And then he proceeded to put photographs down in front of me, and clearly in these photographs were structures, uh, mushroom-shaped buildings, spherical buildings, and towers. And at, at that point, I was very concerned because I knew we were working in compartmentalized security. He had breached security, and I was actually frightened at that moment. I worked there for three more days, and I remember going home and naively thinking, I can't wait to hear about this on the evening news. And here it is, more than 30 years later, and I hope we hear about it tonight. And I will testify under oath before Congress that what I'm saying is the truth. I was able to go into restricted areas, which this was. And this was an aerial photograph of the Earth, and the shadows of the craft or whatever it was. But I realized at this point that it's very secret, that it was kept secret, because I asked him, what are you going to do with this piece of information? And he said, we always airbrush these out before we sell them to the public. And it was a picture of a UFO. That brings us to our break. We'll be pick up right back with this amazing testimony from the Disclosure Project 2001. Everybody stay tuned. That is what he told me. And he also was afraid, he said, that the astronauts are told to keep this quiet. They're not allowed to talk about it. So I do want to let you know that I worked out there for a number of years, and this I ran into this. So it's not something everyone knows that works out there for a long time. My boss didn't know about it. It's, it's very strange because I don't know how they can do it, but they can let some people know about it and then others not. I'm willing to testify before Congress that what I'm saying is true. That I was involved in situations where we actually did recoveries of, tra of crashed saucers, for lack of a better term, debris thereof. There were bodies that were involved with some of these crashes, but also some were alive. While we were doing all this, we were telling the American public there was nothing to it. We were telling the world there was nothing to it. But the whole situation is, we've sat back, we've told the American people that there's no such thing as UFOs. I've been involved where we have recovered these objects. We know them to be of extraterrestrials. I was the first person to go ahead and see that there were bodies on it. That would be the first of approximately 12 events. UFO crashes are not events that take place every day. They're rare. I know we're not alone in the universe. I know that the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. It's evidence that has been denied to the American people. I stand before you today in my almighty God and I tell you this. If Congress calls me in, I stand here today prepared and ready to do just that. Governments must never lie to the people. My question is to Cliff Stone. You said that you had seen aliens on a, on a craft that had crashed. I wonder if you could describe what they looked like. I could, but it would probably take a whole lot of time. The reason I state that, when I got out in 1989, we had cataloged 57 different species. You have individuals that look very much like you and myself that could walk among, among us and you wouldn't even notice the difference, except for some of the things that uh, they might be able to go ahead 
even in a dark room and touch an object and go, go ahead and identify what color that object might be. They would have a heightened sense of smell, sight, uh, hearing. Situation is that you have, but you had at least three types of the grays. You had some that were much taller than we were. Uh, the unique thing I th uh, that I'd like to point out for the most part is that the entities that we did catalog were in fact humanoid being so to speak, not necessarily look humanoid or be bi bipedal such as we are. But apparently we got quite a few of the species out there that are humanoid in appearance. And this is why it's important to support Revolution Radio because you won't get this on mainstream media. Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, the mainstream media screwed us with that event. Uh, it should have been covered um, in a proper light. I didn't see that on CNN. I didn't see that on Fox. You just, I'm so glad you pulled the highlights. It is very important. I hope you listeners really understood every single thing that was said. I mean, the fact that there's a base on the moon, the fact that NASA airbrushes uh, photos of planets and the moon before they give them to us. I mean, the, just everything. And, and I love that last statement. The absence of evidence does not mean the evidence. The ep the absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. And I think I, I, that sums it all up. I was kind of hoping that you played the bit where uh, in the Disclosure Project, you know, because as a kid, I remember clearly like Richard Dreyfuss in, in uh, you know, Close Encounters. He, he comes out, out of like a, a caravan, walks into that UFO wearing Ray-Bans and, and a red boiler suit, you know, and he was going off-world. He was an off-world officer. And so... I was kind of hoping we were going to mention that part about, you know, Gary McKinnon, who who'd heard about this off-world officer and went searching on the NASA site. Um, I, I was kind of hoping we could get into that bit. Oh, yeah, Gary McKinnon, yeah, he's another, yeah, he got into some of the, uh, some of the NASA stuff with, uh, which brought up a lot of the disclosure project. You know, this, that little six-minute clip is of an hour and a half in which uh, at the end there was 22 cameras of all the major networks on the back row, and everybody was cheering. It was like a world event. You know, when I went up there sitting behind, you know, all these people and, and in front of all these cameras, I thought, my God, I am so honored to be part of this world-changing event. I couldn't imagine where we're disclosing that in the black projects we've got the technologies that uh, to, to, to solve the world's energy. We can get off nuclear, we can get off oil and everything. But uh, let me play, uh, it's only a minute and 43 seconds, what CNN did. Now, if you're a PSYOPs agent and you'd have to, you had to sanitize this, how could you do it? Let's do it. Are you, are you still there? Yeah, let's do it. Oh, okay. So, you know, what you'd have to do is make it sound like we're not wanting a congressional hearing regarding illegal rogue operations that are denying presidents and CIA directors. By the way, that's how this whole thing came about in the beginning. In 1993, uh, Clinton uh, wanted to know about the UFO issue and had his CIA director, James Woolsey, attempt to get information. Well, what happened is the infiltration is such that uh, they have these unacknowledged special access projects, and it doesn't matter if you're president, head of intelligence, or the, or the director of the CIA, you get denied access. And so uh, a frustrated CIA director who was denied access to this uh, called a meeting, and uh, Dr. Greer brought all the supporting evidence, big stack of documents to prove the reality. The first thing out of the director's mouth was, I know the subject's real. I'm trying to figure out why the hell I can't gain access to it. Uh, he became aware of the gravity of the situation, met with military advisors. They decided one or two witnesses get discredited or worse. And so the only way to do this is bring out hundreds of witnesses. So from 1993 to 2000, uh, over 450 witnesses, now there's over 500, um, he gathered together to go to the National Press Club. And by the way, he did have his life threatened, you know, to do that. And the first hour was jammed. So they had 250,000 people lined up to, to see this. But they didn't need to have the jamming or, or anything like that because the mainstream media did a perfect PSYOPs job on it and made it sound like the that we're wanting to know about uh, is there life on other planets? And uh, we're wanting to have a congressional hearing on the reality of UFOs and nothing else. So 
Let me just play this little short clip, if I may. Of course. Life on other planets? Some former military and government personnel say they have proof there is. Elaine Quijano explains. We've seen the photographs and heard the stories of what some say is evidence of UFOs. Now a group of scientists, former Air Force and FAA officials, is lending its voice to the argument that we are not alone. Dr. Stephen Greer heads up the Disclosure Project, a group that compiles information from people who say they've encountered extraterrestrial forms of life. We can establish through this testimony that these objects of extraterrestrial origin have been tracked on radar going thousands of miles per hour, stopping and making right-hand turns. Since 1993, Dr. Greer says he has videotaped testimony from more than 100 people about what they say are close encounters. People like retired Navy Commander Pilot Graham Bethune, who believes he saw a UFO 50 years ago while flying to Newfoundland. Then it appeared over to the right and moved out slowly and flew with us. It was still not at our altitude, but we could see the shape of it. It had a dome. In addition, the Disclosure Project says it has documents supporting its case, including FAA records and CIA memos. What do members plan to do with their information? They hope Congress and President Bush take notice. They want to see congressional hearings into the matter, despite criticism from skeptics. Those that don't want to believe you will never believe you anyway, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the truth. A spokesperson for the Senate Science, Technology, and Space Committee says no congressional hearings are planned right now. Elaine Quijano, CNN. Now you see, that was a psychological operations masterpiece to totally uh, make it sound as though this group of people wanted to have wanted President Bush to have a congressional hearing on the reality of UFOs. And, you know, that's not going to get anybody attention. This is four months before 9-11. Everything went off the radar after that. But uh, <laughs> what, what you can do is, like, out of the first hour, everything was so explosive. You really have to hunt for him to say something like that. And notice they say, oh, despite the criticism from skeptics, or the skeptics, you know, <laughs> you always have to have the discrediting element. And, and, and so what... What, what Dr. Greer is saying, the one part that they clip out of the whole thing is these objects of extraterrestrial origin have been tracked on radar going thousands of miles per hour, stopping and making right-hand turns, cut. But I would like to play right after where they cut it, where he's saying, make careful note of what he says right after making right-hand turns. We can establish through this testimony that these objects of extraterrestrial origin have been tracked on radar going thousands of miles per hour, stopping and making right-hand turns, that they use anti-gravity propulsion systems, which we have already figured out how they work in classified projects in the United States, Great Britain, and elsewhere, that these objects have landed on terra firma, at times have been disabled, and have been retrieved specifically by teams within the United States that extraterrestrial life forms have been retrieved and their vehicles have been taken and studied thoroughly for at least 50 years. We can prove through the testimony and documents that we will be presenting that this subject has been hidden from members of Congress and at least two presidential administrations and that the Constitution of the United States has been subverted by the growing power of these classified projects, and that this is a danger to the national security. And that is the danger to the national security. So you can see that the average guy sitting back watching the evening news, you know, and hearing the uh, CNN, which is kind of the flagship of you know, the PSYOPs operations, you know, would just think, oh, you know, well, that's cool. You know, they got all these people together that think UFOs are real, but, you know, I mean, Congress isn't going to waste taxpayer money on having a congressional hearing on the reality of UFOs. But notice what they do. They keep saying, the media keeps saying, we are not alone, which they want to put in the subconscious of everybody that, oh, there's a possibility of extraterrestrials, like the false flag uh, ET threat that Werner von Braun on his deathbed warned about. That could work for that agenda. But... Uh, what happened was, after I went to Washington, uh, CBS sent a special assignment team uh, down to interview me. And they, 
And I said, look, don't bother coming down unless I can say, unless you guarantee and promise me that I can say that we have the scientists within these black projects that can come forward in an open congressional secrecy-free hearing that can prove that we have energy solution within these black projects that can end the energy and environmental environmental crisis, you know, end of the dependence on nuclear and oil. Um, they promised up and down. They came down, interviewed me for 45 minutes. And the only thing that came out of that, and the, the, the uh, reporter who, uh, who did the interview, she was in tears on the phone. She said, I I'm sorry, I know I promised, but the higher executives, uh, read CIA, made me cut out that part. And the only thing I got to say was, uh, we've reached a critical point where the truth needs to be revealed to the people. I'll just play. It's only about a minute long. Go for it. Is what they keep putting out there. While, you know, in 2011, we sent a petition with thousands of signatures on it to the Obama administration, and they basically came back, and, you know, this is with 500 witnesses. There is no evidence whatsoever, you know. And when I was... Uh, you know, I was a site administrator. I know some technical things, and I was able to create an online fax, that, and I was able to get all the embassies of the world and the president and all the Congress people. Uh, 30,000 faxes went out to those people, uh, and I had about, uh, oh, about 60, 70 of them were, were sending the responses back from, you know, the president and, and the Congress members. And, you know, they're basically they're out of the loop. And what they do is they cite these outdated Project Blue Book, uh, you know, based on the condom committee and said there's nothing to it, uh, where they, they refuse to look at, although we provided a four-hour executive briefing video of all these uh, witnesses and a 500-page briefing document, nobody wants to touch it. It's too much of a hot potato. When I was on Capitol Hill meeting with about two dozen senators and Congress people, with you know the rest of the witnesses, um, the only one congressman uh, said that you know the secret government is in control of this issue. The only one was like outwardly spoken and aware of that. I won't say who it is, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so you know, basically our government is out of the loop it's a very um it's a very closed group that's a breakaway society mj12 whatever you're going to call it that is working with the cia which all the indications are that uh you know back in the end of the world war ii the cia got infiltrated and all this was uh a lot of help from alan dulles who uh you know, assisted in bringing like 3,000 Nazi spies because Reinhard Gellin, the head Nazi spy for Hitler, had the Soviet intelligence hidden away in these microfishes in the Bavarian mountains and used that for a trading cart in order to bring 3,000 Nazis into the CIA. And then, you know, the Project Paperclip. And then they, he had the paperwork on 5,000 Nazis rewritten so they all escaped down to Argentina and, and the area around there. So what's happened is uh, when Truman set up the CIA, he set it up with no congressional oversight. So it's like the perfect avenue for infiltration because back then they knew there was two CIAs going on. One was trying to hunt down the Nazis, and you have Alan Dulles who was helping to recruit the Nazis you know, into the system. So you have this, uh, it could be that Preston James is right, that we've got, you know, good guys and bad guys, I guess, in our intelligence community, and that uh, they know who each other is, but, you know, it, it's kind of a, a rough situation, like Gordon Cooper said, you know, that they just started telling one lie after another lie, and they have to cover that with another lie, and they, and, and they don't know how to come out with it. And this brings us to our final break. We'll pick up right back with Dan Willis. Everybody stay tuned. We're on Radio View. But that point being, with all that being said, Dan Willis's site, of course, the webmatrix.net. There is so much amazing information. I strongly urge you all to go check it out. Again, the webmatrix.net. Again, w, uh, www.thewebmatrix.net. T H E W E B A T R I X dot net. Webmatrix.net. Anyway, back right where we left off, right before we. 
It went to the break. We were speaking about so many things, but uh, we were going towards psyops, what the government does to us, uh, how they spin their stories, and how they uh, they screw with our minds and uh, essentially keep us retarded. Go ahead, Dan. Let's talk. Let's <laughs> well, you know, it's taking me a while to wrap my head around this, too. Like I said, you know, this company in Hollywood wanted me to write an article on, on media control, you know, basically the psychological operations. And in, in having to research, you know, some, uh, there's some good historians, you know, that have uh, like, you know, Professor Quigley, uh, Joseph P. Farrell, uh, Richard Dole, and a, a lot of different people have dug in uh, and looked at the history that has been taken out of the history books. When I started researching this thing, I found out that uh, in 1940, uh, 1946, right after World War II, the Rockefeller Foundation came in and had the whole history of World War II rewritten in order to gain a certain perception of what really happened. You know, so, you know, that, that should be illegal, you know. But, you know, people, with, people who have enormous amounts of money, I mean, like you talk about the 0.00001% or whatever, that have huge amounts of money, seem to be able to buy, you know, it's not like the golden rule where, People treat each other how they want to be treated. It's the, uh, you know, who's got the gold makes the rules because they could buy out or bump off whoever they gets in their way. So, you know, apparently the, the official history of World War II is rewritten. And as I studied the history of World War II, it's fascinating and disturbing what was going on with, with the Nazis and that uh, they had planned, they knew the war was not exactly going right and they had you know secret underground they were masters at building underground bases and things and uh you know they had already uh reverse engineered an et craft that crashed in the black forest they had uh, maria's orsic back in 1919 that had these plans which uh Dr. Schumann at the University of Munich uh, saw as viable that was channeled, you know, from uh, this group that produced anti-gravity craft. And, uh, you know, and look, just looking through history for myself, I just happened to notice that in 1944, there were two U-boats, one in Norway that had 67 tons of mercury in it. And uh, another one going on its way going to Antarctica had 37 tons. Both were sunk. That's a lot of thermometers. And, you know, in looking at that, when I was in Washington, I sat down with Mark McCandish, who, by the way, uh, uh, let me just play a real quick clip on him, because his colleagues saw the alien reproduction vehicles, which, by the way, used mercury in the, uh, in the center tube with the Tesla configuration in order to create an anti-gravity lift. And here is, his, is a very short, it's 22 seconds. No problem. First, you witnessed three flying saucers at a very large hangar at Norton Air Force Base. The presentation that Brad talked about was for top military brass and certain congressional but the fact that there were three discs at that exhibit, these discs were hovering off the floor without any visible means of support. They were referred to as alien reproduction vehicles. And, you know, he came to, the, he was one of the 21 witnesses and brought a very detailed a scientific illustrator, you know, for the Defense Department. And, and the center column used mercury. And you know that Himmler was searching the world over for out-of-the-box ancient technology. And, you know, the Vermadas in India also used mercury as the spinning element that uh, caused the gravitational lift. And so, um, you know, you talk about, you know, a bird being going down there to Antarctica to wipe out the Nazi base and these discs coming out. So the thing they, is they that also, in in america the germans at that time were also trying to get hold of helium from america and being sort of like um you know um what's the word when when you're taboo to have it you know they wasn't allowed to have it and so that's why they were looking for alternative energies as well because of you know the the embargo as it was yeah, they wanted to be completely independent. They were totally thinking out of the box. And there was like, according to Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens, who was, you know, at the time, he uh, 
he witnessed documents that showed that there was uh, nine saucer factories of which eight were relocated. One was destroyed. It was uh, relocated down to Antarctica, which was called Base 211. Another one to the Brazilian jungle. Another one they had an, uh, another secret underground facility up in, in Norway. And so what – and and, you know, the, the whole thing about the Nazis discovered the uh, in southern France the uh, King Solomon's treasure, which had incredible riches, which they brought off in Operation Eagle Flight. Uh, and they bought 750 front corporations, you know, and along with the, all the gold and everything, they had an amazing esoteric knowledge of the whole science of the matrix of consciousness that came back from the ancient mystery schools of the time of Akhenaten that was, you know, guarded by the Knights of Templar and everything. So, you know, really deep esoteric understanding of the matrix of reality. And so what the Nazis had planned was what they called Vulcan Schellenskrieg, which means worldview warfare. They planned on infiltrating into the United States and totally engineering the perception of the people in a, over a long period of time. And, you know, I'm, I'm kind of an older person, you know, so I remember, you know, back in the 50s, you know, watching, uh, you know, some of the science fiction movies and stuff that were all engineered ever since the day the Earth stood still every single science fiction movie that has hit the big screen has been engineered by CIA liaisons in Hollywood in order to gain a certain perception. That's why we have all these evil aliens coming to kill us and take over the planet. And, you know, the majority of the themes, you know, like Independence Day is like a, a good example. So they wanted to put into the subconscious minds of everyone that, you know, uh, you know, this they have an association of fear with with the extraterrestrial situation. So, you know, it could very well could be that, uh, uh, you know, it's inter that they're planning a hoaxed alien invasion because uh, President Clinton was on Jimmy Kimmel Live, I think it was April this year, and he said that, uh, oh, he sent his aide down to, uh, you know, Area 51. There was no aliens down there, but we know that's not true because he sent his CIA director where he got denied access. And he also said that, uh, you know, let's just hope uh, it's not like the movie Independence Day where we'd all have to gather together and, and make nice, he said, you know, which is one of the plans in order to create this one world government that uh, has no divisions or anything. But anyway, back to the worldview warfare, what happened was, um, uh, see, General Donovan which uh, was sent over to London to the Tavistock Institute for uh, PSYOPs training for, before setting up the OSS by both Roosevelt and Churchill, which were both Freemasons, and was kind of circumvented our, uh, um, our uh, disconnection with England. And, and so what they did was they set up, uh, with Alan Dulles, they set up Operation... Uh, uh, Mockingbird, which started relations with all the major media, and you know today the CIA basically controls all the distribution of the information, and so they have it in our entertainment industry, they have it in our education, they have it in our mainstream media. I mean, you know, thank God for the alternative uh, networks that we're on. You know, I suggest everybody support these wonderful people. Uh, you know, to be able to get the truth out. That's what we need to do, and that's exactly what we're doing on the station. And you hit several good points, and that I—that's what it needs to. We got to get the truth out so we can finally get full disclosure and get our hands on this clean energy and and this cabal that's running us and the psyops that they're using against us, this propaganda, false flags, all of the above. <clears throat> what do you think it's going to finally take to get to disclosure? Because obviously, we're doing the best we can. Every bit helps. People are awakened every day. It's a slow awakening. Grant Cameron, when he was on here recently, was describing that uh, it's more like a drip-by-drip drip disclosure versus, he thinks, than a full POTUS, President of the United States event. Um, but what do you think is, is going to be our tipping point? I was always kind of hoping there would be a giant UFO floating over the Super Bowl or over the Olympics that would just stay there for the entire time or something like that. But we haven't seen that yet. Or in the movie Signs, where they a bunch of crop circles pop around the world, and the next thing you know, a bunch of the UFOs come right above them and stay there for a couple of days. 
that would be kind of a, a disclosure event to me. But I, I don't know how else to do it because we're, we're trying. What do you think? Well, I've given that a lot of thought. And, you know, I, I've been to Washington, I met with Congress, we sent 30,000 fra- faxes, I've, I've traveled across half the United States in major cities, um, uh, you know, I've been on coast to coast, uh, you know, CBS, you know, uh, you know I've, I've just started, you know, doing more shows. And, you know, only the NSA really knows if, how the psyops are really working, because, you know, just recently in London, uh, you know, William Binney, who was the, uh, he was like one of the most senior code breakers of the NSA who, who quit after the Bush administration started the new policies. He was disgusted with it. And he said the, uh, the primary goal of the NSA, which has been infiltrated as well, all the intelligence elements have been, uh, is population control. And we know that, you know, Snowden said his sole motive for coming out was to tell the American people what is done in their name and what's being used against them. You know, so um, I have thought, you know, how do you fight this thing? You know, I mean, you can do talk shows, you can share with your family and friends. But, you know, my, a lot of my fam- family is like evangelical Christians, so they think, you know, I'm a crazy uncle, you know, on UFOs and stuff, you know, but... Um, you know, the more I think about it, I think uh, maybe this has to do with consciousness. Maybe it has to do with the collective consciousness in which we're all, as science has shown, we're all part of. And that there has to be a tipping point. They calculated it to be like uh, the square root of 1%. If you have, what, 6 or 7 billion people on the planet, that's only about 8,000 people, you know. So um, if people could start to understand the implications of what's been, it's not just about disclosing about the reality of UFOs. Most pe- a lot of people know that, you know, UFOs are here. Uh, a lot of people have questions about it, but, you know, we're way past ET 101. A lot of people are aware of the secret government. And so we're past secret government 101 too. What we're going, moving into is fully understanding the implications of what, the future of earth is going to be like if uh if if the tipping point happens like what you're saying where no longer is there a psych- psychological operations be fooling anyone everything become start to become transparent and obvious where uh, there'll be no place for these people to hide anymore because there's more of us there's only a few of them comparatively than the rest of the entire planet, which they've been, you know, maintaining to keep us keep us retarded, and you know they want to reduce the population so they can have a small managed slave force. So I think it's that we use the awareness that you know through thank God you know alternative networks like yours, uh, you know the information gets out there, and you know don't take anybody's word for it. Yeah, you can go to the webmatrix.net. I I've just recently put that information up this year. I mean, to me it was kind of shocking and wrapping my head around the whole thing that these things, but you know, the check the references, I have citations at the all, you can check that and and from many many other witnesses. Don't just take one witness point of view. Research for yourself. Look at what all the witnesses are saying. You start to put together the pieces of the larger picture. And the larger picture paints that our legal government has been infiltrated by rogue operations that are maintaining uh, the control on this issue that are tied into some of the wealthiest, you know, banking families and whatnot. And that uh, they work kind of in in conjunction with each other. Each other. Let's say the Nazis that were brought into, uh, you know, our CIA and everything. They had that plan of uh, worldview warfare, where they would they would create the perception. And as each, you can imagine that people being born now and they're watching television, going to school, going all the indoctrination. They haven't a clue. What's been what they've been born into in the indoctrination, and so this is what you know. We have the thing that we have going for us is all the whistleblowers and witnesses and their official collaborating documentation and all the uh, uh, cookie jar lids. You could say that all the glitches in the reality that everybody you know, like 
okay, building seven, nothing happened, let's see, and it fell down by itself, okay. You know, all these different little things that are going on all through the world, everybody senses in the back of their mind, there's something not quite right, and you want to trust that that trusting voice on CNN and CBS that's telling you the truth, but, you know, as you dig into it, you'll find out there are innocent people that believe they're telling you the truth, but all the information of the distribution of that information has been very, very carefully, they know the psychology of the human mind, and they know how to carefully craft that in order to, quote, engineer consent of the populace to do the things they do. And they seem to continually create new enemies and new wars, and then it feeds the... It was like the, the whole lie about the Soviet thing cost us $8 trillion with the, with the Cold War. And now I think it was uh, Columbia University is like, I figured what the Middle Eastern War is, it cost us about over $6 trillion. Imagine all of that money being released to, uh, to help, help people on the world rather than feeding the industrial military complex and the people like uh, General Snudley Butler who saved us in 1933 from a fascist coup of the government saying war is a racket, that uh, huge profits are made for a few amount of people at, at the cost of many. You know, I've been in the Vietnam War under combat action. I, I want to do anything I can to help any young people that go through the hideous wars and all these poor guys coming back with uh, PTSD from the, you know, the wars in the Middle East. Uh, God, we've got to stop this stuff and release these technologies, stop these nuclear power plants, re retrofit them with zero-point energy devices. Uh, you know, we haven't, we haven't needed oil. We even have anti-gravity, so we don't need roads Everybody could have their own little power plant, and so we can just take out all the power lines across the, across the country, which are CME uh, susceptible anyway, and everybody could have their own power source. We could, we could desalinate the oceans, uh, have fresh organic crops, and destroy all the GMO ones, you know. I mean, the whole world could be transformed to a beautiful paradise. I mean, it's far removed from perfection, right? But at least it's going in the right direction, better than the direction of of deception that the whole human race has been living in. Yes, absolutely. And we need to end this race, this, this deception. And that's what I really hope we're getting at. Dan, we have about five minutes left or so about this show. And there's so many things I wanted to get to. You mentioned Snowden. I wanted to say one little comment. When we had the Senator Gravel on here the first time, I, we asked him about Snowden. And remember, he's wanted for treason. All right, he's wanted for treason, and they're telling him to come back to the United States. Come back and take a plea deal. Yeah, right. What? He'll take life instead of death. Anyway, point being, Senator Gravel called him a hero, so I just wanted to give a, a credit for that because you have a former U.S. senator actually doing the opposite of what the other senators are doing, these uh, puppets. But this deception has to end, and it saddens me that it hasn't ended. It saddens me that... We're still using 150-year-old technology in our cars, the internal combustion engine, which we t obviously have had way better technology to you know, use clean energy and not use, have these oligarchy of oil cartels and, and banks uh, running us in every single way, wiping out the middle class. Um, anyway, Dan, we got, like I said, five minutes left. I want to leave whatever you want to talk about for the next five minutes because obviously you've been an amazing guest and it's going to take forever to get uh, to, to speak with you because I have so many questions. I could literally go on for a week straight with you and I still think there would be more to talk about. It would So this is going to have to be a continued series of different uh, events of, of us doing shows uh, for sure. That's a fact. Uh, but nonetheless, what would you like to speak about until the rest of the show? <laughs> in five minutes it's a, it's a complex subject you know and you know it, it very complex you know, yes I, you, know, you know uh and, and it's purposely that way but you know when you once you start knowing what to look for and you start all of a sudden bada bing bada boom all of a sudden the the dots start connecting and you look at classified documents that get leaked out and and you look at what witness testimonies who don't even know each other, what they're all saying, and you start it starts to form a picture, and the picture starts becoming you know clearer and clearer and bigger and bigger, 
and you know and we're we're still at the tip of the iceberg you know i was totally naive when i went to washington thinking i was part of a world changing event and and still uh when they asked the company asked me to be part of this uh this uh, article on media control, I was still naive. I didn't realize as I researched through history, I found out more. So I'm sure I'm still naive on so much more on this. But, you know, everybody's got to start someplace to start to understand the deception that all of us have been born into and understand the mechanisms and what's been hidden. Well, by you talking, you're actually doing exactly that. You know, it's it's people like you that have come forward, people like you that have actually had such high clearance, people that you that were involved. I mean, obviously, if you didn't have your clearance, I don't think people would have reported what happened in the incident in 1969. And obviously, you became aware to start looking into this. And then, of course, when you found out all these other credible people were speaking on the subject and adding little pieces to the puzzle, you became part of that. And you came forward and you were an integral part of the uh, disclosure project that Dr. Greer put together. And you also touched on a very important point earlier. And I'm, again, we're going to run out of time on this topic too consciousness. Uh, every, a lot of people are picking up on that. Colin Andrews, after all this time, uh, recently changed this, you know, from crop circles, focus only, to consciousness. Grant Cameron, you know, not so much presidential UFO anymore as he is consciousness. Dr. Greer, he went from disclosure project to consciousness, and you mentioned it. What do you tell us about that? We again, we got. I, I would like to invite everybody to go to the web matrix, the web matrix dot net. There's a link there at the very end. It's called Imagine This, and I made an audio file, and it's also in text. I made a visualization for people to go through to imagine these children of the future looking back through. Earth's history and looking at the deceptions and how the Earth was transformed into a beautiful paradise, and it's all based on uh, things I I witnessed you know firsthand, and uh, I'd like to invite everybody to to do that. You know my my grandfather was a 33rd degree Mason, and you know I have connections with royal family. I don't know, and he died early in Argentina. So I don't really know much about that, but. You know, I've I've been studying consciousness for some time. I worked in a parapsychology laboratory with Dr. Marcel Vogel, and we were uh, doing a lot of research work with the, the uh, interface between consciousness and matter. So it's an interest of mine, and I'm beginning to see that uh, it may be that we discover who we are, really, and get out of the illusion and use our creative power to transform the world, you know, through consciousness. Yes, so, I, that actually brings us to the end of our show. We have an unidentified flying object.